So thank you everyone that submitted your questions for this Q&A video. As you can imagine, I had more questions that I've received than I'm going to be able to answer in this video. My apologies to those that we're not getting to, but maybe next time. Looking forward to this one though, putting this one together. We have some really good questions here. We're going to have some fun. Let's go ahead and dive in. Make sure you follow the show on Twitter so that way you can participate in future Q&As by submitting your questions there. MC17 Clark. We all know Summer loves the Tribal Chief and Piglet loves Braun Strowman. Not anymore. Fuck him. Uh, but who do Panda and Snowcone love? The ladies. They're pussy cats. Get it? Ha! <laughs> ha! They love the fucking ladies. That's what they're about. Yeah. Piglet, I don't know who she's a fan of right now. We gotta figure that out, but fuck Braun Strowman. And also, did Feisty and Precious have a favorite? If so, who? Feisty's favorite wrestler was Precious. Precious's favorite wrestler was himself when he used to give Feisty the... Uh -uh. I miss those two. And they really never had, like, a favorite. Like, I was always Smokey and Mock motherfucking Henry. Uh, Eyes Leslie. Ooh, it's a lady. What is the worst thin ring injury that you have seen? <laughs> now, obviously, I won't go Owen Hart because that's, oh, too soon. Uh, I wonder if you had asked me this question intentionally. It almost feels like you're trying to get a rise out of me. <laughs> and of course, it's going to work. What do you think about the worst in ring injuries? The greatest in-ring injuries in professional wrestling history, they are one in the same. That is Psycho Sid with his big boot of justice off of the second term buckle. To of all people, of course, who else could it have been? Fucking Scott Steiner. They did the math backstage and they miscalculated. And as he had the greatest heel turn of all time because Johnny Ace told him that he needed to expand his offensive repertoire. Professional wrestling history was made. And 20 plus years later, it is truly one of the iconic moments of all time, of all time. Because Sid rules the world. He got up on the second row. He got a woo. Ah! And the match fucking continued around him. And then Steiner bumped into his fucking leg as it was shattered in like 12 different way directions. They bumped into his leg twice since sitting there laying in the ring as the match is continuing. <laughs> All because Johnny Ace said, You gotta expand your repertoire, kid. <laughs> <laughs> See, we, we all need a new, a good laugh once in a while. Thank you, Leslie. That was fun. Raiden Xerox. Your thoughts on the four pillars of AEW, and do you think their heavyweights should be AEW World Champions too? To the second part, sure. Doesn't have to all be heavyweights, and it also shouldn't all be small guys and midgets. Variety, potpourri, spice, that's good. Uh, the four pillars of AEW, very marbly in their composition. Not a lot of dark. It's all limestone. And so you're going to say, what about Sammy Guevara? What about him? Motherfucker ain't any darker than me. Come on now. That is the four pillars of marble, and it is so perfectly suited to AEW. Now I'm glad you're starting to see the bullshit with that company in that way. Little DJ boy was watching the Goodfellas movie, and I suddenly remember Dino Bravo. <laughs> any thoughts why this may be? Bang bang Z gave you a cigarette and you went to bang a bang 18 times and Dino Bravo's dead. <laughs> you seeing random guys get shot dead? Remind you of Dino Bravo. I totally get it and understand it because I feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> Andreas underscore Bri Byron. Do you think Vince McMahon regrets not making Akeem the African Dream the first black WWF champion? <laughs> Yes. They took the one man gang and made him Akeem the African Dream. <laughs> Cultural appropriation to the nth degree and it fucking worked. Yeah. 
Yes. I keep the African dream in the first. But I tell you, you have to repeat it. Oh, God. We're already off to a banging start. It's one of the best starts of a Q&A I can remember. Jack, will you review Bound for Glory? Only if we get the match that we want. Sting, CM Punk, there is still time. There is still time. Let us not delay anymore. Let's sign on the dotted line. Sting versus CM Punk at Bound for Glory. If they have that match at Bound for Glory, you goddamn right I'll watch it. You goddamn right I'll review it. Otherwise, that show can company can kick rocks. Yeah. We want Sting versus Bound for Sting versus Bound for Glory. Well, Sting is Bound for Glory. Sting versus CM Punk at Bound for Glory. Fuck them kids. The future is now. That's AEW's motto. James Faluka, Center 51190. This ought to be fun. I'd like to get your thoughts on Crow Sting. How important was he to the success of WCW during the Monday Night Wars in your view? Went from the colorful, flashy, white meat babyface to a dark and brooding badass who was the ultimate opposition to the NWO. The NWO doesn't work very well in 97 without Sting. You have to have somebody that the fans can get behind. You have to have somebody that could be a challenge. That shit that Bischoff and them did with Sting in 97 unfortunately led to the match at Starcade, which was the drizzling shit. But the buildup and the stuff they did that year in 97 was freaking fantastic. A perfect example of how you borrow elements from current pop culture, borrow the crow, feed into the goth things and... You saw Taker doing this at a similar time with his career. Taking a darker turn. Fucking brilliant. The best thing that he ever did for his career was become Crow Sting. Kill Link underscore Mukahid. Rich criteria must be fulfilled in order to call a wrestler a true legend. That is an excellent question. Because that word gets thrown around way too much. Way, way, way too much. Now you say... Stars, superstars, greats, all-time greats, legends, icons. There should be very few at the top. The next level, legends, like you're going to have more of them naturally throughout the history of the business, but it shouldn't be that many. Sting is at least a legend, if not an icon, like the name suggests. Hogan, Andre, icons. Austin, Rock, legend to icon. You're going to say, what? You got to look at the longevity here of them at the top. But you can throw them based off of their ability to make money in the business. Icons. You know, seen as more like legend, like a forced legend. Triple H, legend. You know, Flair is going to go into the icon status. Dusty Rhodes is going to go into the icon status. You have some of those guys, but, you know, for me to be considered a legend, you do need to be one of the all-time greats and not just somebody that was around a long time and wrestled 20, 30 years ago. You need to have been a significant player in the business for a significant period of time and not just because fans now go back and look at your match and say, yeah, these matches were pretty good back then. No. You needed to be that shit, dude. Like, yeah. Like, you'd call Kane a legend because there's longevity there. Certainly. You know, but not everybody that's been around 15, 20 years is a legend, let alone an icon. Um... There need to be some standards. Like you need to be made a certain amount of money, reached a certain level, had a relevancy of an extended period of time. Hard for me to define them on the fly, but that's just some of the things I'm thinking of. Kevin Cuerno. Rey Mysterio recently criticized this generation of wrestling, saying that it looks too choreographed and less realistic. Did he? Oh, I guess, I'll take your word for it. I guess he did. Is that what separates him from any one of today's flippy floppy wrestlers? Um... Oh, Ray has some really choreographed looking shit too, let's be clear here. But not nearly to the level or degree of the sloppy shit that you see now that a lot of fans try to pass off as great. It's different. Almost everything looks incredibly rehearsed and choreographed. Whereas you can go through Ray Mysterio matches and see a lot of crisp movement, great timing. You don't see that shit now. So he was right to criticize him and that's what would separate him from some of the ones of the day. So I'm going Shuaku. The Austin Rikishi storyline is often criticized for the heel turn. However, given Austin's performance of wanting the highest revenge plus the bloody beatdown Rikishi took, 
How well do you think it holds up from a psychological standpoint 21 years later? I really don't fucking care about it holding up from a psychological standpoint 21 years later, if I could be transparent and honest here. I get why Rikishi signed up to turn heel, because he was thinking about it. I'm going to get to work a program with you know, The Rock, Triple H, Stone Cold Steve Austin. At that time in the company? Yeah, the dancing and tool cool shit is fun and all. But this is where I can make more money. Again, the name of the game is to make as much money as possible. It may not always work out that way, but you could either be Rikishi and back that thing up and do the too cool shit and be over and make some money, or you could make the truly big time bucks, and that opportunity only comes around once in a lifetime for a guy like Rikishi. So you had to do it. I get it. Um, a lot I could say about that storyline, but I don't really care about it holding up from a psychological standpoint. Dalek of Chaos. Who do you think deserved a world title run the most? Vader, Ken Shamrock, Owen Hart, Bam Bam Bigelow, Ted DiBiase, Jake Roberts, Razor Ramon, Mr. Perfect, or Rick Rude? Uh, Owen Hart. You could have had him beat Brett at some point in time in 94, and it wouldn't have hurt Brett. That would have been the one for me. Even like in the early stages of the Attitude Era, if, if him and Austin would have worked together, you know, after Austin's neck injury, if he'd come back in 98 and done an angle with that. Maybe made some money. Even early 99, you could have done some money with that. So it would have been legit heat there. It would have worked. Splash Bro Kieran, why do you think WWE let Big E, their champion, introduce Fury and Wilder on Saturday night, but barely acknowledge Sasha's Emmy nomination on The Mandalorian? Both are great for publicity and can help to get more eyes on the product. Karen, I don't know how else to put this, but where the fuck have you been all this time? The difference is, the dynamic is, is that Big E's doing it in the way that WWE envisions, in the way that WWE wants. Sasha's gone and done it outside of the WWE, and they don't agree with it. They don't buy into it. They don't see it, and therefore, they're not going to support it the same. And that's just a fact. They've always been this way, and that's not going to change. Carlos Palma. Oh, a good question. Fuck, Mary kill. Jade Cargill, Jacqueline, Linda Miles. Shaniqua? Did you throw in Shaniqua here? Interesting. Oh. Like, basketball ref, Linda Miles? Or mid-2000s Amazonian goddess Shaniqua? Fuck, Linda Miles. Mary Jade Cargill. You already knew where this was going in. Uh, kill Jacqueline. Anything that has been touched by the founder will not be touched by me. Spinner Media YT. Looking back 10 years later, how important was Joker Sting for Sting's career? And where does it rank in terms of your favorite versions of Sting? What would you tell someone that never watched Joker Sting about him? Joker Sting was fucking fantastic. It was awesome. And I miss it to this day. And there's still time for him to go back to it, damn it. <laughs> and bow for glory. And the match against CM Punk would be the perfect time to do so. It's like how Finn Balor randomly pulls the demon out of his ass once or twice a year. Except in this case, this character, Joker Sting, is legit fucking awesome. That's the difference. I think it was important. Put a little bit of a different element to him in TNA. Freshened him up a little bit. Brought a different element to the show. In terms of my career, versions of favorite versions of Sting, it's second behind Crow Sting. And it's not that far behind. King James 097, fuck Mary Kill. Liv Morgan, Mandy Rose, and Sasha Banks. Oh. I'd fuck Sasha Banks. Only in Triple H town, if you get my drift. There'd have to be discipline taught or something. I'm going to marry Mandy Rose. I'm going to kill Liv Morgan. Sorry. I have to choose a white girl. I'm trying to spruce it up here. You probably were assuming I was going to say marry Sasha Banks. But, you know, the thing that scares me about Sasha, even compared to the other two, is once she's not on TV and she takes off out the makeup, like, I'm going to feel like I'm dealing with an entirely different woman. And that's not cool. So I'm, I'm good with that. But, like, a one time from behind... Uh, pound Town to Triple Hville, so be it. Metalhead 674, should CM Punk and Chris Jericho renew their feud from 2011, and if so, how should it start? At this point in time, no. What CM Punk should be doing is running with it. He wants to face all of the young talent in AEW. 
because he wants to bury all their fucking asses on his way to the top. That's right. He's pissed off that wrestling tried to move on without him. People trying to act like they're a bigger deal than him. Like, go with it. Give CM Punk an edge. That'd be fascinating. You Eventually, you could go back to him in a Jericho. But, nah. No need to do that right now. Nebek Sid. As much as Vince has lost it over the years, who, if anyone, is capable of taking the reins of WWE when Vince is done and gone? Uh, nobody. Although you'd wonder if Nick Khan is potentially being positioned for that. But nobody. As bad as it is with Vince, it will only get worse with his daughter and son-in-law and his son. Do not get it twisted. It will get worse. Biggest underscore Hedis. In your review with King of the Ring 1998, you said that we can almost hold that Hell in a Cell match accountable for today's spot monkeys. Not exclusively, but yes. Certainly, certainly contributing factor. Would you also put ECW and the culture they created in that category in the Attitude Era in general? Absolutely. Because many of the wrestlers in the business today grew up on that shit. The difference that they don't get and they don't seem to understand is that shit worked, all the crash TV and all the fucking extreme, high intensity, high physicality stuff worked. Because people bought into the characters and the stories. They were emotionally invested when they did all of this shit. Now they sit there and do that fucking Hell in a Cell spot, both of them, at the end of a random ass Dynamite. Or a random ass Smackdown or Raw, doesn't matter. So yes, that era is definitely a lot to blame because it pushed the, the envelope too far. And something got lost in translation where these young kids came up and said, Hey, I have no personality. I'm never going to be that big. I can't talk worth a shit, nor do I care to try because that comes into video game time. So I'm just going to crash test dummy. And they worked in ECW and worked for these other guys in these other companies back then. So it'll work for me. And they totally missed the plot. Becky for life. Have you noticed that out of the four horsewomen so far, only Sasha and Bailey have put Bianca over and clean too? Is this one of the many reasons you like them as performers more than Becky and Charlotte? That's a good point. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Sasha at all. I don't think you ever say that. But she annoys me less, much less, than Becky and Charles Flair. Charlotte Flair. Charles. Charlotte Flair. Her fans are as bad as any of them. But yes, I'd much rather watch a Bailey or a Sasha Banks than a Becky Cringe or a Charles Flair, Charlotte Flair. And then Avpurv Shankar closing us out by saying, recently you were talking about who had the best one year in the history of the wrestling business. Um, who would you choose? Hogan in 87, Austin in 98, or The Rock in 2000? That spun from uh, my dude on Twitter, Alex Khalil, who I've followed for a long time. Sometimes he says some good things, and then sometimes he says kind of dopey AEW fanboy type of shit. But it's still fun. Like, it's cool to interact with people you don't always agree with. I enjoy that. I enjoy that. We could use more of that. Uh, but he said that Brock Lesnar had the best year in wrestling history, which is just fucking dumb. Like, to be clear, if you wanted to make the argument of best first year, Maybe that's a different conversation even even then. I think you've got Kurt Angle, you've got Hogan in his return to WWF in that 84-85 time period. Like, there have been better first years, but the way he put it was like the best year ever. And saying Brock Lesnar's run from that Raw after WrestleMania 18 to WrestleMania 19 in no way, shape, or form is the greatest single year in WWF slash E history, let alone wrestling history. Not even fucking close. And I pointed out the shit about The Rock in 2000, the number of pay-per-views that he main evented. And like, you know, some people rightly pointed out, well, Triple H was a big part of that, so couldn't you put Triple H? You absolutely could. Both of their 2000s fucking Barry Brock Lesnar's 2002 to 2003. It's insane. Um, Hogan in 87. Like that run from you know the lead up to WrestleMania 3 to that main event in February of 88. You think about it, in that run, main evented with Andre in front of 90 plus thousand people at the Silverdome. No matter what Meltzer Math says. You don't know what the fuck he's talking about. Um, then, you created on the back of that Survivor Series in November of that year. Royal Rumble in January of that year. And then, in, by the time you got to the summer, you created SummerSlam. 
So literally that feud created their other three big four pay-per-views that remain to this day. But Brock Lesnar's 2002 was better. Uh, but you look at Hogan in 87. Austin 98. Rock in 2000. Damn. That's tough. Because I talked about all the stuff with Hogan. And it's easy to shit on Hogan. It's easy to dismiss everything with Hogan. But the problem is, is just because you don't like Hogan, just because he's a fucking racist, doesn't change what he accomplished in wrestling. It doesn't. You can't act like that. The Rock in 2000, you know, like some people pointed out, like you could point to Kurt Angle in the great year he had in 2000 and Triple H the year he had in 2000. You know, Rock was the top babyface, the top guy at one of the hottest periods in wrestling history, and that was all without Austin being there for the vast majority of the year. Um, Austin's 98. Goddamn. My personal bias would say Hogan for that 87 to 88 time frame. There is a piece that I could say Austin was critical to the company at that time and represented the real shift towards the attitude, the real shift to WWF doing something different, the beginning of the end in some respect for WCW's both dominance in the Monday Night Wars and then as a company as a whole. So... You could argue it was equally, if not more so, important. Rocks 2000 was a great year. I still have to go with Hogan in 87. When you look at what was built off of that and the money drawn and everything else, like, yeah. If somebody wants to disagree with me and say Austin's 98 was the best one year in WWF slash E history or Rocks 2000, I won't beef because it's close. Personal bias. In terms of remembering that time, it's probably Hogan. Um, but I could make an argument for Austin there in 98. Because it was that important. It was that significant. So anyways, thank you everybody for submitting your questions for this Q&A. I enjoyed this one. This was a lot of fun, especially at the beginning. More questions like that in the future. Yeah, let's do it. Make sure you smash that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Do another Q&A probably in a week or two or so. Other content coming up on this channel, so stick around.